Hey, thank you guys for worshiping with me tonight. It's, uh, it's a great experience. Well, the best is yet to come. I hope I'm not building you up too much. <laughs> Expectation is high. Uh, this is my good friend, Dr. Becker, Cornet Becker. He told me to call him Cornet. So that means we're friends now, right? <laughs> well, yes, okay. It's official. <laughs> Just added a Facebook friend. No. Dr. Becker works at Regent University with, you, all of you know Dr. Josh, he tonight opened us. Him and his wife, Jen, both uh, did communion and offering with us tonight. And Dr. Becker works with them. He is an ordained minister and is involved in ministry all through Hampton Roads, but not just Hampton Roads. He's traveled the world and had ministry all around the world in Africa, Europe, uh, just all the different places, doing ministry, spreading the gospel, equipping the saints, raising ministers. And now he does it at our very own Regent University. And, uh, yeah, just a great man. I've, had, I've talked to him before and just his heart for uh, the local church and raising pastors and, and ministers. So uh, his influence has impacted me, even though you didn't teach me directly. I graduated from Regent. Pastor Andy and Pastor Sharon graduated from Regent. So your influence is, even though you don't see the fruit always, it's, it's, a, um, it's hundredfold, as the Bible would say. So I wanted to welcome him also because, Dr. Becker, you know, we have an internship program we do here. We've had many interns come through over the past few years. And uh, those from Regent, we have a partnership that Dr. Josh helped us set up. And we have been doing that with the undergraduate school, but we're actually getting ready to look at doing more with the graduate Absolutely. students. And so Dr. Becker's helping us to do that. So we're excited for what God's going to do. So would you guys help me welcome him? Thank Dr. you Becker. so much. Yeah, thank you. Such a very, very good evening. I have to make sure that I'm not going to fall off this tonight. Can you only imagine? Yes, it is such a privilege to be here. And I want to thank, firstly, Josh McMullen for inviting me. Folks, you don't know anybody until you travel with them, right? You know, you might think that you are friends. You might think that you know somebody, but once you travel with them, it's a whole different story. I've traveled with Dr. McMullen twice, not locally, internationally, I might add, both times to Israel. And let me say to you, he is a Christian. <laughs> it was an extraordinary time. I got to know him. He is the real deal. And I'm so grateful for his influence. Folks, I'm also just thrilled to be here. Pastor Andy, Pastor Sharon, Pastor Samuel, and Pastor Roger, what a privilege to be here in your midst. You know, when you've preached and spoken a lot, you can walk into a building and you can know if people have worshipped there. And there's such an openness of the Spirit here. There's such an adoration towards God that I can immediately feel that I'm going to be right at home. Not that that's the most important thing, but I thought I would say that. Um, uh, Pastor Samuel, very quickly, thank you for introducing me a and, and not butchering my name. Um, I'm often introduced as Corny Beaker. Uh, oh, it gets worse. From the country of Africa. And um, it's such a wonderful opportunity, and it actually helps me with a condition that I have called pride, uh, which we're going to speak about just in a moment. And um, I always remind them that uh, Corne is a good Dutch contraction of a good Roman name, a biblical name, Cornelius. You don't hear it often, only in Hogwarts, but no... Um, uh, actual fact in history, one extraordinary figure in the book of Acts and a pope. And I used to say that he was a terrible pope because I thought it was funny. And only recently did I read the letters of Cornelius the first. There's not been a Cornelius the second, but um, I don't know why. Anyway, I read it and I had to repent. The guy was extraordinary. I read all four of his letters. And, and, I, and I know I'm not allowed to pray to the dead, and I didn't. But I said, oh, God, I, just tell Cornelius, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> you know, for publicly saying he was terrible. He was an extraordinary man. And then typically the next question that I get is, now, 
which country in South Africa are you from? And then I said, we get to be a country all by ourselves. And then typically the next question is, is it close to Mexico? Um, I got that yesterday. And, and my answer is always the same. Yes, uh, absolutely. Keep on swimming. And at some point, turn left, right? <laughs> Folks, thank you for allowing me to give a little introduction so that you can get used to my accent. And what you're hearing in the background is kind of muddled kitchen, 17th century street Dutch. And um, <coughs> it doesn't help, right? Uh <laughs> but folks, tonight for a few moments, I want to share with you about an ailment that I think we all struggle with. Ever so often, you have a moment where a trusted sister or brother will share something with you that will cut you to the heart and help you. A number of years ago, I got a handwritten note from a person that I truly admire, singer-songwriter of the 70s. Uh, this is a man that had a profound effect on me in the early 80s through his music. He was kind of one of those folks who became a Christian at the end of the Jesus revolution, the Jesus music kind of time period. And like most hippies, he, he, uh, he moved to Arkansas. It seemed that all of them went to California and Arkansas. But he ended up in Arkansas, and, and he wrote me. I, I, by the way, wrote him an email, and he wrote me a handwritten note back. I don't know what that means. But in the handwritten note, he made the following statement, a statement that I've kept in the front of my Bible because it's been incredibly helpful for me. And in this note, he said, our world has radically changed. Folks, how many of you look around and you can see the drift in our world? In many ways, we are experiencing the real lifetime, uh, in real time collapse of our culture, right? And then he said, he would define this change in the following way. He said, we are no longer living in a secular world. He says, but rather a pagan world and a secular church. Wow. And he said, the major manifestation of this pagan world and secularized church is the ailment of pride. And tonight, uh, I want to share with you something that I am struggling with. Pride is an ailment. It is something that we all face daily. And I think one of the most dangerous prayers that you can pray is, God, arrest my pride. So I decided yesterday what I was going to speak on. And this morning I marched into my office and my assistant, our director of operations, sits next to me. And <laughs> 10 minutes into my day, he said, would you come to my office? And he said, man to man. Let me tell you, you obviously shaved your head this morning and didn't shave most of the back. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he said, you should have a look. It's not that great. <laughs> he said, and I know you have meetings today. You better go home and reshave it again. And I went bright red. And I thought, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this moment. Pride is an ailment, but it's also a form of madness. The Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who started to write at the beginning of the Enlightenment time period, wrote the following about his day. And today, I think this is true of our time. And he said, thus we see, it comes at the end of a very long text, uh, hence the thus. And he says, thus we see that it may be readily happen that a man may easily think too highly 
off himself. I look at social media. And is it not a daily temptation to lie about ourselves? And to project an image that is simply not true. He goes on and he says, this feeling, right? This feeling to project uh, an image of too highly uh, thinking too highly of yourself. He says, it is called pride. In reference to the man who thinks to all of himself, and he says, and it is a species of madness. The scripture says something that is very similar. The book of Proverbs tells us that pride, that pride always goes before a monumental fall. Proverbs says, pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better, it is better, Proverbs says, to be of a lowly spirit. Psychologists tell us that we are seeing a monumental rise in psychological disturbances in our world. I think all of us know people are more anxious than what they've ever been. But psychologists also say there is a monumental rise in a condition that they call narcissistic personality disturbances. And folks, the term narcissism is an interesting one. It was coined by uh, the psychoanalyst, more psycho than analyst, but uh, that's for another time, Freud. And although I, I, I reject almost everything that Freud says, yeah, I think he's correct. And he said, the man that struggles with narcissism is a man that is afraid of fragmenting, falling apart. I think many people without Christ have that feeling, that fear of not only falling apart, but dissolving, disappearing. And Freud says that what these people do is that they create a false membrane around themselves, a false skin to hold all these broken pieces together. And he said, that's narcissism. I want to call that a different word. I'm going to call that pride. And now, folks, the question that we ask today is how do we cure it? It's not good enough that we say we struggle with pride. I'm writing a book at the moment, and, and folks, I am so struggling with it. I started it a year ago. I think it's going to take five years. It's a personal text. I'm writing a book on the first sin. And the book is, and, 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 and you might say, the first sin might be pride. Uh, do you know that the early church fathers say something different? All the rabbis say something different. They say the first sin is not pride, but envy. They say pride is the expression of envy. Clement of Rome, an early church father, he writes during the time that John is writing his gospel. Same time period, roughly. And Clement says the first sin of Satan was envy. He looked at God and he wanted to have what God had. I want to be God. And out of that flowed pride. Clement goes on and he says, he says, and th the first murder occurs because of spiritual envy. Cain and Abel. And Cain looks at Abel and has spiritual envy that God would accept his offering but not his own. And Clement, already writing at the end of the first century, beginning second century, says, even today in the church, we, we don't kill people physically, but we lie, we slander, we gossip, and we destroy them with our words. One of the first texts in the New Testament, James, says something very similar. He says, where there's envy and self-seeking, there's confusion, chaos. In the Greek, says not only every evil thing, but every demon. 
Later on the desert, Father says, envy attracts demons. Where there's envy and pride, uh, the church fathers would say, the demons rise up. So the question is, the question for me today, my own question with my unshaved head, how do I cure pride? If it is a disease, if it is a form of madness, how do we get it out? C.S. Lewis, I think, starts to give us somewhat of an answer, but we're going to go to scriptures in a moment. C.S. Lewis writes when he writes about it, he said, the problem with pride is that it is a complete anti-God state of mind. It is the great sin. How do we cultivate humility? A few quick words, folks. You know that humility is not a gift, right? I've met nobody that's born humble. <laughs> right? If you have children, you know this. Right? They, they, they're not born with this. <laughs> they, not, they don't come out, oh, I'm humble, right? Secondly, do you know that it's not a gift that I can pray for? I cannot line us up here tonight and I walk up to you and say, be humble in the name of Jesus. And you walk out and, whew, wow, <laughs> my pride is gone, right? Doesn't work that way. There's a key here, and actually, Pastor Parker, you must have had access to my notes before you spoke. Um, no, of course not. He was listening to the Holy Spirit. The answer to pride, and we're going to see it in a moment, is worship. Humility is nothing but recognizing who we are before God. Humility is nothing but truth. Truth before God. So the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Roman Philippi, addresses this issue. Now, a little bit, and forgive me for a moment, the professor's going to come out just for like two seconds, and then we'll put him back, uh, just for a moment. The context in Roman Philippi is a context that we know quite a bit about. We know quite a bit about the church as well in Roman Philippi. We know more about any Roman city in the first century. Uh, we know the most about this city, Roman Philippi, except for Rome. It's the second city that we know the most about. And one of the things that we know about Roman Philippians is that they were obsessed with honor. They would have these lists of things that they would write on the walls, telling people how great they were. It was kind of like Instagram on stone. <laughs> These people were obsessed with honor, public honor. In actual fact, in Latin, they had a formal sequence that they adopted called a cursus honorum, a course of honor that Roman Philippians would follow in order to reach the top and to be the greatest. I have a student that studied all of the leaders of Roman Philippi during that time, looking at all the sculptures that we have from that city. And all the sculptures are ridiculous. Firstly, they're always much thinner. And we have this because there are descriptions of certain leaders. And they would say, well, it was not so thin. Right, but when you would see, a bit hefty, but um, when you look at the sculpture, these sculptures are always thinner, always taller, always more handsome. You've heard of Photoshop, right? This is sculpture shop, <laughs> right? And so they would, they would make themselves more attractive. We also know that the church in Roman Philippi was a large church, one of the largest churches in the first century. Some scholars say 15,000 people. And that there was incredible uh, strife and tension in the church between people that wanted to kind of make themselves greater and those that were desiring to follow Jesus. In this context, listen to what Paul says. He says, see if there's any encouragement in Christ, Philippians 2, 1, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Folks, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I think, how? Listen to how provocative it is that Paul is saying. Paul says when you meet somebody, shake their hand and make the decision they're better than you. Do you know our world doesn't work that way? Have you noticed that when you meet somebody the first time in the world, people ask questions? And they're asking questions to figure out who's the top dog. Right? Am I better than you? And there's this competitiveness in the world that we go through. How many of you know most of what happens on social media is a polite form of lying? <laughs> it's a cesspool. Most of, when we read what uh, social media from other people, we don't know what's going on in their lives. Right? And so when I look at this, and Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, my question is, how? How do you cultivate humility? It's interesting, uh, for a while I worked in a leadership school. <laughs> Our students had to do kind of uh, interesting, uh, for a lack of a better phrase, dissertations. And uh, I had one student that decided he wanted to study humility and leaders. Have you ever wondered how difficult that is to study? You send somebody a questionnaire, like at scale, I am humble, zero to five, all right now. Think about it, it's impossible to study. Because if somebody says, yes, I am, super humble, right, um, probably not. The only way that it can happen is if somebody else observes it. And I look at all of this and I say, how? Folks, and this is really the crutch of what I want to share today. If pride is a species of madness, as Spinoza would say, if pride is the complete anti-God stands, as C.S. Lewis would say. And if we are to obey what the Apostle Paul says in sacred scripture, to do nothing out of selfish ambition, nothing from conceit, but in lowliness esteem others better than yourself, to look out for the needs of others and not just yourself. How? That's the question tonight. Marvelous thing is, Scripture gives us an answer. John Calvin writes a commentary on Philippians, and this is what he says. All right, I've picked the one for the trail one more time. By the way, I love the screen. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this might travel with me if I had a bigger car. All right, John writes about this with Calvin. I love this. It is said, he says, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face. Folks, how do you deal with pride? You have to see God. The vision of God is the cure for pride. That's why I was so thrilled with our worship tonight. The worship that we had was so focused on Christ, so focused on the glory of God. It was holy and pure. And I was thinking, we are in a bath of being cleansed. How are we cleansed from pride? When you look to God, truth comes to you. That, that membrane of narcissism is dissolved in the presence of God. And then when you think you're going to fall apart, you don't because you find out that He is the ground of your being and that in Him we live and move and have our being, as the Scripture says. So the question is, how do we, how do we deal with this madness of pride? Look at God. So very quickly, and I know it's always dangerous to get a professor up here or a preacher. Oh, Lord, Right? And then many years ago, my son was in high school, and he had a friend over, and he said at some point for the friend, he said, don't ask my dad any questions. We'll be here until every cow in Virginia comes home. <laughs> we love the voice, son of our own voice. It's a problem, right? <laughs> but very quickly, the Apostle Paul actually answers. 
this question of pride in the very next few verses. And in verse 5 of Philippians 2, 5 to 11, dear sisters, dear brothers, we find a beautiful worship hymn. Scholars refer to this as the Carmen Christi, the song of Christ. A few quick things, and I know I cannot help myself. Most scholars believe this predates Paul. Most scholars, including myself, believe it is the oldest portion of the New Testament. Doesn't it just make sense to you? What should be the first response of the church? Worship. It's by no accident that most scholars believe the first portion of the Hebrew Scriptures is a worship song, the Song of the Sea, Exodus 15. Worship. And Paul says, how do you do this stuff? How do you deal with pride? You worship. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm just going to read to you this beautiful hymn, and then I want to highlight just five things, and then we're done for tonight. I know it's Wednesday night. It's Friday. Paul quotes this hymn, and he says, Let this mind be among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I love the ESV translation here. He says, this mind, this attitude that's in Christ, belongs to you. Let me retranslate it. What is Paul saying? Look to Jesus. Gaze upon Him. Worship Him. And when you see His example, your pride will be destroyed and you will learn to be humble. Listen to what he then says. Though he was in the form of God, it's not count the quality of God a thing to be grasped, but can I retranslate it? Paul is saying, it's no stretch for Jesus to think that he's God because he is. That's it. Simple as that. Right. He says, but he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. And being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And folks, if you look at that, this is how we deal with pride. We gaze at Christ. And in this hymn, five things are said about Jesus. He emptied himself. I overprepared, so I've got way too many slides. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll make them available. You have to be emptied of self. The word that is used here. It's the strong oris of a word, kenao. We get a theological construct from that called kenosis. The best definition I've ever heard of kenosis comes from a theologian by the name of Kevin Cronin. Kevin says, kenosis, listen to this, is the resolute divesting of the claim, of every claim of self-interest, so that you are ready to live the gospel of Christ free from what you want. When you gaze at Christ, you don't want to hold on to power, privilege, or prestige because you know you are who you are before Christ, before God. In Him I live and move and have our being. We are ready to take the form of a servant. Folks, there's a difference between serving and looking like a servant. And nobody wants to look like a servant. But when you imitate Christ and you have that desire to imitate Him, guess what happens? You're ready to take on the form of a servant. Thirdly, ha, if you want to be more like Jesus, may I encourage you, be more human. He took on the form of a man. Actually, fact, the hymn says it twice. And being found in appearance as a man. Let us embrace our humanity and embrace the humanity of others. Give them grace. Fourthly, he practiced humility. He actively humbled himself. Mother Teresa of Calcutta was once asked, how do you deal with pride? She says, you have to feel humble. Do things that make you feel humble. Some good advice there. Confession. A radical embracing of truth. And once you invite Jesus to enroll you in his school, that will happen. And lastly, obedience. Now, folks, I want to end here for a moment. If pride is a form of madness, how, how, how are we cured? 
gaze of Christ. Have an extraordinary vision of him. And once you see him for who he is, a desire will be birthed in you that you would want to imitate him. And when we imitate him, we come to what God has created us to be. Created in his image. The Apostle Paul in another place in his letter to the Romans says, for this you were born. He says, for this reason God has created you so that you might be conformed to his image. God has a plan for you. There's a plan for me. The plan is that before you die, you're going to look like Jesus. Somebody said to me the other day, based on that, you're going to live very long. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and yes, and amen. And indeed, that is true. Folks, we live in a world that has gone mad with pride. How refreshing it is to be amongst Christians that imitate Christ. Humility cannot be faked. Humility is also, let me say this, intoxicating. When you find somebody that's truly humble, there's the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. When you fall in love with Jesus once again. Am I there? No. Am I on my way? Yes, I am. My deepest desire is to let this mind be in me which was in Christ Jesus. And I'll close. There's a beautiful young girl by the name of Agnes of Prague that lived in the 12th and 13th centuries. Agnes was the princess of Bohemia. Her father was the richest man in the world. Most powerful man as well. Agnes, however, had a radical conversion experience. And if you've ever been to the palace in Prague, I don't know if you've been, that palace is the largest palace in Europe. They're playing me off, folks. I'm, I'm <laughs> done. All right. Let me finish with this, and then I'll pray. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary thing that happens. Agnes has a radical conversion experience, and she wants to follow Jesus. So she writes a letter to another friend that she knows of in Italy, a girl by the name of Claire of Assisi. You've heard of Francis. This is the female ministry companion. She says, how do I do this? How do I get rid of my pride? I've grown up in the palace. I am the richest, most wealthy, most powerful family. Agnes gets a letter back from Claire. Let me tell you what Claire said to her, and that's what I want to leave with you. She says, this is what you do. She says, fall in love with Jesus. She says, you are strengthened in your holy service through an ardent desire for the crucified. If you struggle with pride tonight, as I do, fall in love with Christ. Gaze at him. You cannot change yourself. And as we seek to imitate him, these are the things that will happen and our world be transformed. Let us pray. Father, tonight we come to you in the name of Jesus through the power of your spirit. And Lord, we ask, would you come and get rid of our pride? Lord, would you teach us humility? Would you remove any false membrane from us? But Jesus, would you come and help us fall in love with you again? Open our eyes so that we might see you. And that we might be enrolled in your school of humility so that we might find rest for our souls. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor Parker. Amen.